chapter fifty two of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter fifty two great march of intellect now i come to larger actions and the rise of great events and the movements of mankind enough to make their mother earth tremble and take them for suicides and even grudge her bosom for their naked burial often had i longed for war not from love of slaughter but because it is so good for us it calls out the strength of a man from his heart into the swing of his legs and arms and fills him with his duty to the land that is his mother and scatters far away small things and shows beyond dispute god's wisdom when he made us male and female the fair sex after long peace always want to take the lead of us having rash faith in their quicker vigour of words and temper but they prove their goodness always coming down to their work at once when the blood flows and the bones are split into small splinters and a man dies bravely in their arms through doing his duty to them but though war is good no doubt till men shall be too good for it there was not one man as yet in great britain who would have gone of his own accord into the grand and endless war at this time impending master roger burkrolls told me that throughout all history every in and out of which he knew while pretending otherwise never had been known such war and destruction of god's men as might now be looked for he said that it was no question now of nation against nation such as may be fought out and done with after rapid victory neither a piece of mere covetousness for a small advance of dominion nor even a contest of dynasties which might prove the tougher one but that it was universal clash half of mankind embittered to a deadly pitch with the other half and that now no peace could be till one side was crushed under these things were beyond my grasp of widest comprehension neither could i desire a war begun about nothing anyhow if the frenchmen insulted our flag or wanted back some of their islands or kept us from examining their customs when imported no true briton could hesitate to keep his priming ready but at present they were only plucking up courage to affront us being engrossed with their own looseness and broad spread of idiocy for they even went the length of declaring all men to be equal the whole world common property and the very names of the months all wrong after this it was natural and one might say the only sensible thing they ever did to deny the existence of their maker for it could hardly be argued that the almighty ever did lay hand to such a lot of scoundrels now if these rats of the bilge hole had chosen to cock their tails in their dirt and devour one another pleasure alone need have been the feeling of the human race looking down at them but the worst of it was that real men and women far above them took up their filthy tricks and antics and their little buck jumps and allowed their judgment so to be taken with grimaces even as a man who mocks a fit may fall into it that in every country there were sympathizers with the great and glorious march of intellect in devonshire i had heard none of all this for none of the servants ever set eyes or desired to do so on public journals they had heard of these but believed them to be very dangerous and wicked things also devoid of interest for what was the good of knowing things which anybody else might know and even if they had taken trouble ever to hear of the great outbreak they would have replied until it led to recruiting in their own parish this be no concern to we but in our enlightened neighbourhood things were very different there had long been down among us ever so many large-minded fellows anxious to advance mankind by great jumps towards perfection and in this they showed their wisdom being all young bachelors to strive to catch the golden age before they got rheumatics however to men whose life has been touched with the proper grey and brown of earth all these bright ideas seemed a baseless dance of rainbows 
man's perfection was a thing we had not found in this world and being by divine wisdom weaned from human pride concerning it we could be well content to wait our inevitable opportunity for seeking it in the other world we had found this world wag slowly sometimes better and sometimes worse pretty much according to the way in which it treated us neither had we yet perceived in the generation newly breached any grand advance but rather very poor backsliding from what we were at their time of life we all like a strong fellow when we see him and we all like a very bright child who leaps through our misty sense of childhood to either of these an average chap knocks under when quite sure of it and yet in our parish there was but one of the one sort and one of the other bardie of course of the new generation and old davy of the elder it vexes me to tell the truth so but how can i help it unless i spoil my story ever so many people got a meeting in the chapel up to sign a paper and to say that nobody could guess the mischief done by all except themselves they scouted the french revolution as the direct work of the devil and in the very next sentence vowed it the work of the seventh angel to shatter the church of england they came with this rubbish for me to sign and i signed it and some of them also with my well-attested toe and heel after such a demonstration any man of candid mind falls back on himself to judge if he may have been too forcible but i could not see my way to any cross-road of repentance and when i found what good i had done i wished that i had kicked harder by doing so i might have quenched a pestilential doctrine as every orthodox person told me when they heard how the fellows ran but as my bad luck always conquers i had but a pair of worn-out pumps on and the only toe which a man can trust through his own defects of discipline happened to be in hospital now and short of spring and flavour nevertheless some good was done for parson lower not only praised me but in his generous manner provided a new pair of shoes for me to kick harder if again so visited and the news of these prevented them but even the way these fellows had to rub themselves was not enough to stop the spreading of low opinions for the strength of my manifestation was impressive rather than permanent also all the lower lot of nonconformists and schismatics ran with their tongues out like mad dogs all over the country raving snapping at every good gentleman's heels and yelping that the seventh vial was open and the seventh seal broken to argue with a gale of wind would show more sense than to try discussion with such a set of ninnies and when i asked them to reconcile their admiration of atheism with their religious fervour one of them answered bravely that he would rather worship the goddess of reason than the god of the church of england however the followers of john wesley and all the respectable methodists scouted these ribbles as much as we did and even hezekiah had the sense to find himself going too far with them and to repair the seventh seal and clap it on hepzibah's mouth for how could he sell a clock if time was declared by the trumpet to be no more amid this universal turmoil uproar and upheaving i received a letter from captain bampfylde very short and without a word of thanks for what i had done for him but saying that he was just appointed to the bellona seventy four carrying six carronades on the poop that she was fitting now at chatham and in two months time would be at spithead where he was to man her he believed that the greater part of the fine ship's company of the thetis would be only too glad to sail under him and he was enabled to offer me the master's berth if i saw fit he said that he knew my efficiency but would not have ventured to take this step but for what i had told him about my thorough acquirement of navigation under the care of a learned man after saying that if i reported myself at narnton court by the end of october he would have me cared for and sent on he concluded with these stirring words there is a great war near at hand our country will want every man young or old who can fight a gun 
these last words fixed my resolve i had not been very well treated perhaps at any rate my abilities had not been recognized too highly lest they should have to be paid for with a little handsomeness but a man of large mind allows for this feeling that the world of course would gladly have him at half price but when it came to talking of the proper style to fight a gun how could i give way to any small considerations fuzzy and ike were stealing rock at this particular period in a new catch called the devil wholly in honour of parson chowne and through these worthy fellows and bang now the most trustworthy of all i sent a letter to narnton court accepting the mastership of his majesty's ship of the line bellona now everybody in earnest began to call me captain llewellyn not at my own instigation but in spite of all done to the contrary the master of a ship must be the captain they argued obstinately and my well-known modesty had the blame of all that i urged against it but i need not say any more about it because the war has gone on so long and so many seamen have now been gilled that the nation has been stirred up to learn almost a little about us while i was dwelling on all these subjects who should appear but miss delushy newly delivered from candleston court on her round of high education and to my amazement who but lieutenant bluett delivered her i had not even heard that he was come home so much does a man when he rises in life fail in proper wakefulness but now he leaped down from the forecastle and with a grave and most excellent courtesy and his bright uniform very rich and noble and his face outdoing it forth he led this little lady who was clad in simple grey she descended quite as if it was the proper thing to do and then she turned and kissed the tips of her fingers to him gracefully and she was not yet eleven years old how can we be amazed at any revolutions after this bardie i cried with some indignation as if she were growing beyond my control and she stood on the spring of her toes exactly as she had done when two years old and offered her bright lips for a kiss to prove that she was not arrogant none but a surly bear could refuse her still my feelings were deeply hurt that other people should take advantage of my being from home so much to wean the affections of this darling from her own old davy and perhaps to set up a claim for her burke rolls knew what my rights were and finding him such a quiet man i gave it to him thoroughly well before i went to bed that night i let him know that his staying there depended wholly upon myself not only as his landlord but as holding such a position now in newton and nottage and miles around that the lifting of my finger would leave him without a scholar or a crust also i wished him to know that he must not as a wretched landsman take any liberties with me because i had allowed him gratis to impart to me the vagueness of what he called mathematics in the question of navigation of that queer science i made out some but the rest went from me through the clearness of my brain which let things pass through it otherwise i would have paid him gladly if he had earned it but he said or i may myself have said to suggest some sense to him that my brain was now too full of experience for experiments and of all the knowledge put into me by this good man carefully and i may say laboriously i could not call to mind a letter figure stroke or even sign when i led the british fleet into action at the battle of the nile nevertheless it may all have been there steadily underlying all coming through great moments like a quiet perspiration but if i could not take much learning here was some one else who could and there could be no finer sight for lovers of education than to watch old mr burkrolls and his pupil entering into the very pith of everything i could not perceive any cause for excitement in a dull matter of this sort nevertheless they seemed to manage to get stirred up about it for when they came to any depth of mystery for fathoming it was beautiful to behold the long white hair and the short brown curls dancing together over it that good old roger was so clever in every style of teaching that he often feigned not to know a thing of the simplest order to him so that his pupil might work it out and have a bit of triumph over him he knew that nothing put such speed into little folk and their steps be they of mind or body as to run a race with grown-up people whether nurse or tutor 
but in spite of all these brilliant beams of knowledge now shed over her our poor bardie was held fast in an awkward cleft of conscience i may not have fully contrived to show that this little creature was as quick of conscience as myself almost although of course in a smaller way and without proper sense of proportions but there was enough of it left to make her sigh very heavily lest she might have gone too far in one way or the other her meaning had been from her earliest years to marry or be married she had promised me through my grey whiskers often with two years to teach her her own mind never as long as she lived to accept any one but old davy we had settled it ever so many times while she sat upon my shoulder and she smacked me every now and then to prove that she meant matrimony now when i called to her mind all this she said that i was an old stupid and she meant to do just what she liked though admitting that everybody wanted her and after a little thought she told me crossing her legs in the true old style and laying down her lashes that her uncertainty lay between master roger and mr bluett she had promised them both she did believe without proper time to think of it and could she marry them both because the one was so young and the other so old i laid before her that the proper middle age of matrimony could not be attained in this way though in the present upside down of the world it might come to be thought of and then she ran away and danced exactly as she used to do and came back with her merry laugh to argue the point again with me before i set off for narnton court on my way to join the bellona lieutenant bluett engaged my boat and my services both with oar and net for a day's whole pleasure off shore and on i asked how many he meant to take for the craft was a very light one but he answered as many as ever he chose for he hoped that two officers of the royal navy knew better than to swamp a boat in a dead calm such as this was my self-respect derived such comfort from his outspoken and gallant way of calling me a brother officer as well as from the most delicate air of ignorance which he displayed when i took up a two-guinea piece which happened to have come through my roof at this moment perhaps or at any rate somehow to be lying in an old tobacco-box on my table that i declared my boat and self at his command entirely we had a very pleasant party and not so many as to endanger us if the ladies showed good sense colonel lower and lady bluett also the lieutenant of course and a young lady staying at candleston court and doing her utmost to entrap the youthful sailor her name has quite escaped me also delushy and myself these were all or would have been all if master rodney had not chanced as we marched away from my cottage with two men carrying hampers to espy in the corner of the old well a face so sad and eyes so black that they pierced his happy and genial heart i'll give it to you you sly minx i cried for an impudent brazen trick like this what orders did i give you miss a master of the ship of the line and not master of his own grandchild the young lieutenant laughed so that the rushes on the sand-hills shook for he saw in a moment all the meaning of this most outrageous trick bunny forgetting her grade in life had been crying ever since she awoke at receiving no invitation to this great festivity she had even shown ill-will and jealousy towards bardie and a want of proper submission to her inevitable rank in the world i perceived that these vile emotions grew entirely from the demagogic spirit of the period which must be taken in hand at once wherefore i boxed her ears with vigour and locked her into an empty cupboard there to wait for our return with a junk of bread and a cheese rind however she made her way out as her father had done with the prison of dunkirk and here she was in spite of all manners good faith and discipline let her come she deserves to come she shall come master rodney cried and as all the others said the same i was forced to give in to it and upon the whole i was proud perhaps of our bunny's resolution neither did it turn out ill but rather a good luck for us because the young lady who wooed the lieutenant proved her entire unfitness for a maritime alliance by wanting before we had long been afloat although the sea was as smooth as a duck-pond some one to attend upon her 
every one knows what the tuscar rock is and the caves under southern down neither am i at all of a nature to dwell upon eating and drinking and though all these were of lofty order and i made a fire of wreck wood just to broil some collops of a suin who came from the water into it through a revival of my old skill and to do a few oysters in their shells with their gravy sputtering to let us know when they were done and to call for a bit of butter no small considerations or most grateful memories of flavour could have whispered to me twice thus to try my mouth with waterings over such a cookery but i have two reasons for enlarging on this happy day and these two would be four at once if any one contradicted them my chief reason is that poor dear bardie first obtained a pure knowledge of her desolate state upon that occasion at least so far as we can guess what works inside the little chips of skulls that we call babyish everybody had spoiled her so being taken with her lovingness and real newness of going on and power to look into things together with such a turn for play as never can be satiated in a world like ours not to mention heaps of things which you must see to understand let me not overdo it now in saying that this little dear had taken such good education through my liberal management as to long to know a little more about herself if possible this is a very legitimate wish and deserving of more encouragement than most of us care to give to it because so many of us are not the waifs and strays and salvage only but the dead shipwrecks of ourselves content with the bottom of the great deep only if no shallow fellows shall come diving down for us having the joy of sun and sea and the gratitude for a most lovely dinner such as none could take from me i happened to lie on my oars and think while all my passengers roved on the rock they were astray upon bladderweed popweed dullusk or weed ribbons frills kelp rack or five tails anything you like to call them without falling over them my orders were to stand off and on till the gentry had amused themselves only i must look alive for the tuscar rock would be two fathoms under water in about four hours at a mile and a half from the nearest land the sunset wanted not so much as a glance of sea to answer it but lay hovering quietly and fading beneath the dark brows of the cliffs which do sometimes glorify and sometimes so discourage it the meaning of the weather and the arrangement of the sky and sea was not to make a show for once but to let the sunset gently glide into the twilight and the twilight take its time for melting into starlight this i never thus have watched except in our old island there was not a wave to be seen or felt only the glassy heave of the tide lifted my boat every now and then or lapped among the wrinkles of the rocks and spread their fringes not a sound was in the air and on the water nothing except the little tinkling softness of the drops that feathered off from my suspended oar-blades floating round a corner thus i came upon a sight as gently sad as sky and sea were a little maid was leaning on a shelf of stone with her hair dishevelled as the kelp it mingled with her plain brown hat was cast aside and her clasped hands hid her face while her slender feet hung down and scarcely cared to paddle in the water that embraced them now and then a quiet sob in harmony with the evening tide showed that the storm of grief was over but the calm of deep sorrow abiding what is the matter my pretty dear i asked after landing and coaxing her tell old davy captain david will see the whole of it put to rights it cannot be put to yites she answered being even now unable to pronounce the r aright although it was rather a lisp than any clear sound that supplied its place it never can be put to yites when the other children had fathers and mothers god left me outside of them and the young lady says that i must not aspire ever to marry a gentleman i am only fit for watkin or tommy toms or nobody oh dio why did i never have a father or a mother my dear you had plenty of both i replied but they were shipwrecked and so were you only before the storm came on you were put into this boat somehow nobody living can tell how and the boat came safe though the ship was wrecked 
this boat she cried spreading out her hands to touch it upon either side for by this time i had shipped her was it this boat saved me yes you beauty of the world now tell me what that wicked girl had the impudence to say to you this i need not here set down enough that it flowed from jealousy jealousy of the lowest order caused by the way in which lieutenant rodney played with bardie this of course interfered with the lady's chances of spreading nets for him so that soon she lost her temper fell upon delushy and upbraided her for being no more than an utterly unknown castaway End of chapter fifty two chapter fifty three of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter fifty three beating up for the navy my other reason for setting down some short account of that evening was to give you a little peace and sense of gratitude to the lord for our many quiet sunsets and the tranquillity of our shores it really seems as if no other land was blessed as ours is with quiet orderly folk inside it and good rulers over it and around it not too much of sun or moon or anything unless it may be now and then a little bit of cloudiness and this love of our country seems ever to be strongest whether at departing for the wars with turbulent nations or upon returning home as soon as we have conquered them but now for a long time i shall have very little peace to dwell upon at narnton court i found no solace for my warmth of feeling polly had been sent out of the way on purpose because i was coming which was a most unhandsome thing on the part of mrs cockhanterbury for the very expectation which had buoyed me up at a flattish period and induced me to do without three quids of cross-cut negro head was my simple and humble looking forward to my polly i knew that i was a fool of course but still i could not help it and i had got on so well among young women always that i found it very hard to miss the only chance i cared for i feared that my age was beginning to tell for often since i had been ashore my rheumatics had come back again neither was that my only grief and source of trouble at this time but many other matters quite as grave combined against me heaviside was not there to talk and make me hug my singleness nor even jerry toms nor the cook who used to let me teach her it was not that all these had left the place for any mischief in an ancient household such a loss is not allowable all meant to come back again when it suited their opportunities and each perceived that the house was sure to go to the dogs in the absence of themselves and one another heaviside had found nanette in spite of my best prognostics overget her seventh occasion of producing small crappus and his natural disappointment with her led to such words that he shouldered his bundle and made off for spithead in company with jerry who was compelled to forsake his creditors and as for the cook i did hear though unable to believe it that she was in trouble about a young fellow scarcely worthy to turn her jack in other respects i found that nothing of much importance had occurred since i was there in the summer time sir philip continued to trust in the lord and the squire to watch the sunsets neither had the latter been persuaded to absolve his brother the captain had been at home one or two days inquiring into my discovery of the buried dolls he did not attach so much importance to this matter as his father had done but said that it made a mysterious question even more mysterious and failing as a blunt sailor would to make either head or tail of it and being disgusted with his brother for refusing to see him he vowed to remain in the house no longer but set off for pomeroy castle again where he had formed a close friendship with the eldest son of the owner his lady-love the fair isabel was not living there now but might very easily be met with for on coming of age three years ago she had taken possession of her domain 
Carey Park, a magnificent place adjoining the Pomeroy property. It was said that the earl had done his best to catch the young heiress for his son, and therefore had made a pretext of the old charge against the captain for the purpose of putting a stop to communication with him but his son lord mohun upon finding how the young lady's heart was settled withdrew his suit like a man of honour and all the more promptly perhaps because he had made up his mind to another lady before miss carey came to them it was said that the captain might now have persuaded the beautiful heiress to marry him and finish their long affection if he could have thoroughly made up his mind that honour would bear him out in it for her confidence was so perfect in him that she left it to his own judgment herself perhaps longing to put an end to their wearisome uncertainty sir philip heard of it and came down to implore them thus to settle themselves and captain bampfylde was so hard set by the nature of the case that he might have been enticed away from what his conscience told him this was that the solemn oath which he had taken in the church with isabel beside him to purge himself of all foul charges ere he made another guilty if himself were guilty could not thus be laid aside without a loss of honour sir philip would be the last man in the world to counsel dishonest actions but being an old man and reluctant that his race should all expire he looked upon that sacrament as no more than a piece of sacrilege or a hasty pledge of which the lord would never take advantage nobody knows what might have happened with captain bampfylde so beset and longing to think that he ought to act as everybody told him but he begged for a night to think over it and in the morning he received his appointment to the bellona even sir philip could not deny that the hand and the will of the almighty must herein be recognized and there was a chance of a brush with spain about the nootka sound just then and if anything makes a sailor's fortune it is a fight with these fine old dons a frenchman is sure to be captured but not half so sure as a spaniard and the hidalgos do turn out good gold with good manners behind it many ships have i boarded but with brightest alacrity always a good fat old spaniard therefore the captain brushed away any little weakness and set out for spithead bravely in a bachelor condition and after trying to collect what news there was at narnton and finding that i must not think of meeting my dear polly i quietly drew my travelling money and set forth to join him only every one will reproach me and have right to do so if i fail to tell the latest tidings of that parson chowne people seem to like this man because they never could make him out and nearly all the world is pleased to hear of the rest being vanquished it seems that a wholly new bishop arose by reason of the other dying and this gentleman swore in the bible to have things in order when he heard of chowne and his high defiance of all former bishops he said fie fie this must not be i will very soon put this to rights to follow up this resolution he appointed tiverton and the old church of st peter for chowne to bring his young people up to a noble confirmation also for a visitation of the clergy all around such as they have now and then to stop the spread of king's evil his holiness the bishop was surprised to receive this answer my dear lord my meat is at calverley on the day you speak of we always find a fox hard by and if he should make for studley coverts i may come down the bolam road in time to meet your lordship at any rate i shall dine at the angel somewhere between three and five o'clock and hope to find you there and have a pleasant evening with you yours very truly r s chowne p s if you bring your two archdeacons we will have a rubber but i never go beyond guinea points the whole of this was written with cumberland lead on the back of a paper showing how to treat hounds in distemper and the bishop was displeased about it and declined his society especially as he had invitation to the good tidcombe rectory and there he was treated so hospitably by a very handsome family that he put up his glass of a noble wine and saw the sun set through it and vowed that his magna charta or habeas corpus or writ of error i never can remember which but at any rate that his royal orders should fall out of his apron pocket if he failed to execute them 
in this state of mind he received a letter from parson chowne himself full of respect and most cleverly turned as well as describing the parson's grief at being unable to bring to his holiness any one fit to lay hands upon the standard set before them had been before laying on of hands to say the lord's prayer backwards and there was not one of them up to it this angered the bishop to such a degree that he ordered out his heavy coach with the six long-tailed black horses and the coachman with cocked hat and flowing wig and four great footmen shouldering blunderbusses himself sat inside with his crozier and mitre and lawn sleeves and all the rest of it now this was just the very thing the refractory parson expected therefore he rode round overnight and bade every farmer in the neighbourhood send all his hands with pickaxes and shovels by four o'clock the next morning also he gathered all his own men there as well as the unclad folk who were entirely at his orders then he sent for parson jack as being the strongest man about there and imparted his intention to him and placed him over the workmen early in the afternoon the bishop's state carriage was described moving up the tiverton high road with a noble and imposing aspect before he arrived at the cross-road leading off to nympton rectory his lordship was surprised to see a great collection of people standing on a hill above the road and all saluting him with the deepest respect not so bad after all he exclaimed brother chowne has brought his men into good order which is the noblest use of the church ah they don't see a bishop every day and they know when a thing is worth looking at for their faces are black with astonishment hallo bob what's that up with the glass your lordship the coachman shouted back or it will be all over with you we are in a damned slough and no mistake and so they were his lordship had no time to slam the windows up before the coach lay wallowing in a bog of nighty blackness in it poured and filled the coach and nearly smothered his lordship who was dragged out at last with the greatest trouble as black as if he were dipped in pitch for the parson had done a most shameful thing and too bad for even him to think of he had taken up his private road and dug out the ground some six feet deep and then by means of carts and harrows transferred to it the contents of a quagmire which lay handy and spread the surface again with road dirt so that it looked as sound as a rock having seen with a telescope from his window the grand success of his engineering he sent down a groom in smart livery to present his compliments to the traveller who had happened to lose his way and fall into a moor hole and was there anything he could do to mitigate that misfortune but the bishop sputtered out through his chattering teeth that he hoped to hear no more of him and that none but a devonshire man was fit to oversee devonshire parsons and this made the fifth bishop conquered by chowne to return to our noble selves that is to say to the better people dealt with in our history at the close of this year seventeen ninety to wit upon christmas day of that excellent year of grace no less than three of us dined together of course with a good many others also in the captain's cabin of the bellona seventy four gun ship of the british navy carrying also six carronades these three were captain drake bamfylde of course the honourable rodney bluett now our second lieutenant and the master of the ship whose name was something like david llewellyn this latter was now remarkable for the dignity of his appearance and the gravity of his deportment and although he was only ranked after the youngest of the lieutenants and just before chits of reefers called by some people midshipmen and though upon any but festive occasions you might not have spied him at the captain's table you could scarcely have found any officer more satisfied with his position and more capable of maintaining it we were cruising off the south coast of ireland under orders to search all ships that might be likely to carry arms but as a frigate would have done for that service as well as or better than a seventy-four we knew that our true commission was to shake together and fall into discipline and bring other seamen into the same if we could get any to join us having a light wind and plenty of sea-room we resolved to enjoy ourselves that day and a very delightful party it was especially after i was called on to spin a few of the many true yarns which make me such a general favourite 
after filling our glasses and drinking the health of his majesty and of the navy at large and especially of our captain we began to talk of the state of affairs and the time at which the war might be expected to declare itself that it must come to a great war with france not even a fool could doubt although he might desire to doubt it ever since the destruction of the bastille in july seventeen eighty nine and throughout all the year and a half since that a wild and desperate multitude had done nothing but abolish all the safeguards of their country and every restraint upon the vilest rabble our wisest plan was to begin at once before this cruel monster should learn the use of its fangs and the strength of its spring but as usual great britain was too slow to seize the cudgel which might happily have saved a million lives however we were preparing quietly for the inevitable conflict as even our presence that day in the cabin of the bellona might indicate master we are sadly short of hands said captain bampfylde addressing me i shall have a poor report to make unless we do something do you think that we could get on without you if i sent you on a cruise for a week or so i think you might sir i answered humbly if it does not come on to blow and if you keep well away from land i have trained mr seabright with so much skill that you may always rely upon him except in any difficulty nobly i spoke and the captain's reply was not very far behind me if we carried seven hundred and fifty men he exclaimed with generous candour we could not hope to have more than one master david llewellyn so diffident so truthful so entirely free from jealousy gentlemen is it not so all the officers assented with a pleasant smile to me and then to one another so that i hardly knew what to say except that i could not deserve it our tender the sea-lark is to meet us in the cove of cork on new year's day continued captain bampfylde and after shipping all our stores she will be for a fortnight at my disposal now you know as well as i do that our complement for war time is six hundred and fifty men and boys and that our present strength is more than two hundred short of that war may be declared any day almost and a pretty figure we should cut against a french liner of eighty guns therefore unless the sea-lark should bring us a very large draught which i do not expect my resolve is to man and victual her for a fortnight's cruise under some one who is a good hand at recruiting would you like the berth master llewellyn sir i know not anything which i should like better our captain perceived that the junior lieutenants looked rather glum at being so passed over from master rodney downwards and though he had the perfect right to appoint any officer he pleased he knew the true wisdom of shunning offence by giving some good reason therefore he went on again there is not one of us i dare say who would not enjoy this little change but i think that llewellyn is our man simply for this reason the part to be beaten up first is the welsh coast from st david's head to penarth i have heard of many good seamen there and especially at lonely i think that none of our officers can speak welsh except master david even you bluet though coming from wales are not up to the lingo this settled it in the best-natured manner and all congratulated me and wished me good speed in getting hold of old salts if possible or else fresh young ones not to be too long about it somewhere about epiphany day in the year seventeen ninety one i stretched away for the coast of wales being in command of the sea-lark a rattling cutter of one hundred tons with two six-pound bow-chasers and a score of pickmen under me i have no time now to describe emotions even of the loftiest order such as patriotism modesty generosity self-abasement and many others which i indulged in when i cast anger off porthcall and they thought that i meant to bombard them i ordered a boat ashore at once to reassure the natives when i had given a waft of my flag and fired a gun to salute it but being now in such a position and the parish to its utmost corners raving on the subject ashore i durst not trust myself because without rupture of ancient ties and a low impression left behind i could not have got aboard sober again and after that could i knock down any of my crew for being tipsy nevertheless i had bardie and bunny and mother jones with her children and master burke rolls and charles morgan and betsy matthews and moxie thomas all brought in a boat to visit me 
besides a few others who came without leave they all seemed to be very well and happy and i entertained them beautifully that same afternoon we made a hit enough to encourage anybody we impressed not only my foe the tailor but also hezekiah that is to say it was not quite what might be called impressment because with no war raging yet we could not resort to violence but we made them both so entirely drunk that we were compelled for their own sake to weigh anchor while having their bodies on board i had a stern fellow of noble mind to back me up at all hazard and seeing what a sneak hezekiah was he gave him six dozen out of hand with my official sanction the horologist to the royal family took his allotment worse than almost any man i ever saw however for old acquaintance sake i would not have him salted in spite of this the effect was such that it brought him round to the english church and cured him of all french doctrine and as he gradually began to lose fat and to dwell upon gunnery we found his oiliness most useful to prevent corrosion having worked this coast to our utmost power and gathered a good deal of human stuff some useful and some useless pretty near threescore in all and put upon short rations we thought that we might as well finish our job by slanting across to devonshire because for the most part you there may find more body but less mind than ours which is the proper state of things for the substance of our navy therefore we drafted off to cork all our noble welshmen and made sail for devonshire now before telling what we did i really must guard against any nasty misconstruction whatever had been done to me on the part of parson chowne was by this time so wholly gone out of my heart and mind and everything any man can feel with that nothing was further from my intention than to stir it all in that matter again i knew that in spite of all the deference paid me now on every side and too much for my comfort chowne would turn me inside out ten thousand times worse than stew could this i like to see done when anything wrong can be found inside a man but a thoroughly honest fellow should stick on his honesty and refuse it so when providence in a dream lay before me the great mercy and i might say miracle of impressing the naked people and bringing them under our good chaplain to be trained from the error of their ways and live i felt a sort of delicacy as to trespassing thus upon parson chowne's old freehold these naked folk belonged to him and though he did not cultivate them as another man might have done it was not difficult to believe that he found fine qualities in them and to take them from under his very nose might seem like a narrow vexation however at times there are when duty overrides all delicacy the bellona was still short of her number by a hundred hands or more and with this reflection i cast away all further hesitation we left the sea-lark off heaven's mouth a wild and desolate part of the coast for my object was to pounce unawares on the parson's savage colony for what we were going to do was not altogether lawful just at present although it very soon would be my force consisted of no less than fifteen jolly well-seasoned tars all thoroughly armed all up for a spree and ready to do any mortal thing at a word or a signal from me if we could only surprise the wild men i had no fear as to our retreat because the feeling of the country would be strongly in our favour as the abaters of a nuisance long pronounced unbearable for five or it may have been six leagues we marched across the moors as straight as possible by compass except when a quagmire or a ridge of rugged stone prevented us we forded several beautiful streams of the brightest crystal water so full of trout that i longed to have a turn at my old calling and we came in view of nympton steeple just as the sun was setting i remembered the lie of the land quite well ever since that night when the fire happened so i halted my men in a little wood and left them to eat their suppers while i slung my spy-glass and proceeded to reconnoitre the enemy lying flat upon the crest of a hammocky ridge of moorland i brought my glass to bear through the heather first upon the great parson's house which stood on a hill to the left of me and then on the barber's settlement the rectory looked as snug and quiet as the house of the very best man could be with a deal more of comfort than most of these contrived to gather around them 
the dens of the tribe that objected to raiment were quite out of sight from his windows nor were they allowed to present themselves to mrs chowne unless she had done anything to vex him shaping my glass upon these wretches i saw that they were in high festival of course i could not tell the reason but it turned out afterwards that the parson's hounds were off their feed through a sudden attack of distemper and therefore a cartload of carrion had been taken down to the settlement it was lucky that i knew it not for i doubt whether we should have dared to invade their burrows at such a period however i thought that nothing could be more suitable for our enterprise of course they would all overgorge themselves and then their habit of drinking water which alone would establish their barbarism was sure to throw them into deep untroubled sleep till sunrise as soon as one could strike a line from the pointers to the pole star which is a crooked one by the by and as soon as it was dark enough for a man to count the pleiads i called my men with a long low whistle and advanced in double file the savages lay as deeply sleeping as if their consciences were perfect whereas they could have had none at all we entered their principal cuddy or shanty or shealing or wigwam or what you will for it was none of these exactly but a mixture of them all and to our surprise not one awoke or was civilized enough to snore higgledy piggledy they lay in troughs scooped out of the side of the hill or made by themselves of clay and straw called cob i believe in devonshire with some rotten thatch above them and the sides of their den made of brushwood some of the elders had sheepskins over them but the greater part trusted to one another for warmth and to their hairiness all this we saw by a blue light which i ordered to be kindled for at first it was as dark as pitch and a stranger or a sadder sight has rarely been seen in england poor creatures they were all so cowed by the brilliant light and the armed men standing in their filthy hovel that they offered no resistance but stared at us in a piteous manner as if we were come to kill them escape was impossible save for the children and most of them thought as we found out afterwards that chowne was tired of them and had ordered their destruction choose all the males from ten years to thirty i shouted to my men who were almost as scared as the savages don't touch the females or i'll cut you down set another blue light burning we don't want any cripples not to be too long with it i only found three men worth impressing the others were so badly built or even actually deformed and of appearance so repulsive that we could not bear to think of turning them into messmates now for the boys i cried we want boys even more than men almost but i found that all the children save one had slipped through the sailors legs adroitly while we were dealing with the men we could not have caught them in the dark and more than this the best sized of them had popped like snakes into burrow holes or like a fox into his earth but the one who stood his ground and faced us was a noble-looking boy in spite of dirt and nakedness with long thick tangles of golden hair and a forehead like a man's almost he looked up at me in a bold steady manner wholly unlike their savage stare and it struck me that here was the little fellow whom i had saved eight or nine years ago from the horse of parson jack but though he appeared to be twelve years old i could not make out what he said except yes yes and me come with oo such was his state of education i hoisted him on a strong man's back for the long march had made me feel my years and perceiving no call to molest the residue or injure their home such as it was we simply handcuffed the three best fellows and borrowed three pig whips of their own made right down ingeniously so as to drive them to hedden's mouth we durst not halt for a rest until there were three leagues between us and nympton moor then hurrying on at the break of day we found the sea-lark at anchor and she sent us a boat at our signal scarcely were we on board of the boat and pushing off with our capture when the clash of a horse's hoofs upon rock rang through the murmuring of the waves we turned and gazed with one accord for the boat lay broadside on to shore through the kicking of the naked men when they felt salt water under them and our quitting good stroke to attend to them 
at furious speed a horseman dashed out of the craggy glen and leaped the pool where the brook is barred up and vanishes down the shingle and shelves of rack he drove his horse into the sea until there was no firmness under him he almost laid hold of our boat not quite for i struck with an oar at the horse and scared him shouting to all of my crew to pull finding himself just a little too late chowne gave a turn to his horse's head and the lather and foam of the spirited animal made a white curdle in the calm blue sea the horse sprang gladly up the shingle crest for the shore is very steep there and he shook himself and scattered brine and there were three other horses behind him on one of these sat parson jack and two huntsmen on the other twain and the faces of these were as red as fire with hurry and indignation only chowne's wicked face was white and settled with calm fury and his style of address to us just as if we were nothing but dogs of his kennel ho you scoundrels he shouted out hold oars and let me parley you at this i made a signal to my crew to slack from rowing and i stood up in the boat and said what can we do for your reverence nothing for me rogues but much for yourselves i will give you five pounds for that child in the stern i want him for knife-cleaning would your worship think fifty too much for him we put him at fifty your worship fifty you robbers well then fifty ten times his value to any one but i have a fancy for him would your worship mind saying five hundred down look at his hair he is worth it for we had washed him in the brook and his hair in drying was full of gold who are you he shouted controlling himself as his habit was when outbreak became useless for the dignity of my demeanour and the nobility of my uniform also the snowiness of my hair combined to defeat the unerring quickness of his rapid and yet cold eyes and so i replied with an elegant bow your reverence it so happens that my name is old davy llewellyn end of chapter fifty three chapter fifty four of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter fifty four taming of the savages after a most successful cruise we returned to our bologna and were received as behooves success with ever so many rounds of cheers it was true that we had sent before us and now brought in an awkward lot but it is beautiful to see how in a large ship's company and under a good commander mere coaster fellows become true seamen and even landlubbers learn how to walk captain drake bampfylde did me the honour of asking my advice as soon as his own opinion was settled and i said no more than bay of biscay which was his own opinion here the very utmost of a noble sea awaited us and none of our landsmen had any heart for fat or even for lean stuff we let them go on for a day perpetually groaning and after that we provided for each a gallon of salt water and gave it them through the ship's trumpet until they entirely ceased from noise these prudent measures brought them into such a wholesome state of mind that really a child might lead them as by one of the prophets mentioned when i read my bible all of our new hands i mean except hezekiah and the three wild men unfortunate master perkins could not enter into the spirit of our exertions for his benefit because his mind was unsettled with knowing the hardship both of his back and front for his back was covered with raw places sitting amiss to the fit of his clothes while the forward part of his body became too hollow to yield him comfort but strange to say his wrath was kindled not against us for these misfortunes but against his wife hepzibah because she had not predicted them and for the greater part of a week the poor fellow lay in a perfect craze upon the orlop deck while the ship was rolling heavily nothing could persuade him but that he was the prophet jonah in the belly of the whale and he took the stowage of our cables for the whale's intestines 
you could hear him even from the main deck screaming at the top of his voice wallow not o whale o whale lord thy servant repenteth only let not this whale wallow so so that in spite of all his tricks hypocrisy pride and gluttony i could not help taking compassion upon him and having a hammock rigged tenderly for him so that his empty and helpless body fell into a deep sleep as long as the prophet himself could have had it for i never could show myself at bridge-end if through my means hezekiah found the sea his churchyard on the other hand though three wild men took their visitation from a wholly different point of view they had never heard either of god or the devil and could not believe themselves even worth the interference of either power for they did not believe that their souls were immortal as i suppose they must have been nor were they even aware of possessing anything more than a body apiece my own idea of treatment was that to bring them into self-respect we should flog the whole three very soundly and handsomely pickle them afterwards nor could i see any finer method of curing them of their hairiness but captain bampfylde who showed the strangest interest in these savages would on no account have them flogged until they gave occasion he said that their ideas of justice might be thrown into a crooked line if the cat and nine tails were promiscuously administered whereas i knew that the only way to make a man dwell upon justice is to give him a taste of the opposite he values the right after this because he thinks there is none of it left upon earth so for the present these three jack cannibals as our tars entitled them sat apart and messed apart and a precious mess it was of it they soon got over the marley mary as the crapas called it and we taught them how to chew tobacco which they did and swallowed it only their fear of the waves was such that they could not look over the side of the ship or even out of a porthole after a few days we fell in with pelting showers of hail and sleet with a bitter gale from the north-north-west i saw the beauty of this occasion to show mankind their need of clothes therefore i roused up these three poor fellows and had them thrown into a salting tub full of iced cold water this made their teeth chatter bravely and then we started them up the rigging with a taste of rope's end after them they ran up the ratlines faster than even our very best hands could follow them because of the power still left in their feet through never having owned a shoemaker but in the main top they pulled up and the wind went shivering through them meanwhile i was sedately mounting as my rank required now with a very old pilot's coat well worn out hanging over my left arm here jack i cried to the biggest one take this and throw it over you to keep your poor bones warm the sheaves of the blocks were white with snow which they always seemed to be first to take and so were the cleats and the weather side of topmast and topgallant mast when you see this you may make up your mind to have every rope frosted ere morning therefore jack cannibal looked at the coat and around it as a monkey does put it on i cried poor fellow put it on to cover you he nodded and laughed as if i were making some joke which he ought to understand and then he threw the warm coat round his body now quite blue from cold but without any perception of sleeves or skirts or anything else except as it were like a bit of thatching and after that he helped us to civilize the rest so that in course of time we had them in decency far superior to the average show of scotchmen and in about the same course of time cannibal jack i do assure you became a very good seaman and a wonderfully honest fellow without any lies in him and yet he said things better than the finest lies that could be told all coming out of his oddness and his manner of taking tameness and if a roaring sound of laughter came to the ears of an officer such as never could be allowed in the discipline of war time the officer always lifted lip to have a smile accordingly and said to himself i should like to know what cannibal jack has said to them the two other naked ones dick and joe as we christened them out of a bucket of tar without meaning any harm to them never could be entirely cured of their hereditary shortcomings we taught them at last to wear clothes by keeping a sharp leather strap 
always handy against which their only protection was a good watch-coat or a piece of sailcloth so that after a great deal of pleasantry we set the ship tailor to work for them but no possible amount of strap nor even cat and nine tails administered by our boatswain's mate a most noble hand at wielding it could prevail upon them to abandon their desire for the property of their messmates they even had the arrogance as their english grew more fluent to attempt to reason it out with us father david said cannibal dick for they had agreed that now i was their patron even as chowne had been you take the crape croppo ship the enemy you call it and then you leave them all their goods not touch one of anything and hand back the ship to him dick none but a savage would talk such rubbish we keep the ship and all it holds and put the men in prison there for you now there for you and you beat us because we take not a great ship but some little thing lying about in a ship from our enemies will you never see things aright dick we are not your enemies we are your friends and to steal things from us is robbery you call it friends to steal us from our place and people and warm dry sands and put us on this strange great wetness where no mushrooms grow and all we try to eat goes into it and then you beat us and drive us up trees such as we never saw before and force us to hide in these dreadful things here he pointed to his breeches with a gaze of such hopeless misery that i felt it would be an unkind thing to press him with further argument however the boy was enough to make up for a far worse lot than these were we soaked him most powerfully to begin with even up to the skin of his eyelids and he made no more objection than a christian child might have offered and after we had scraped him dry with the rough side of a spencer he came out bright i do assure you and was such a model figure that we said to one another that he had some right to go naked for his skin was now as fair and soft as the opening out of a water-lily while his golden curls spread out like flowers of the frog bit also his shoulders so nicely turned and the slope of his side so clever with arms and legs of such elegant mould being thick and thin in the proper places and as straight as a well-grown parsnip then again his ankles clear and feet of a character never beheld after any shoemaking our common fellows made so much of this superior little chap that i was compelled to interfere and show my resolution and this required to be done with some small sense of how to do it otherwise the boy might take the turn of our sour grapes with them and be bullied even more than he had been petted thitherto moreover all the other boys in the ship were longing to fight with him which as he was the smallest of all and not brought up in a christian manner would have afforded him no fair play for his nice short nose or his soft blue eyes the little deer was as brave as a lion and ready to fight any one of them and he used to stand up to my elbow suing for permission and now he began to talk so well that it was very hard upon him not to be allowed to fight a bit according to the natural issue of all honest converse however i would not be persuaded loving his pretty face as i did and i fear that he had unhappy times through the wickedness of the other boys having a stronger sense of mistake than afforded me any happiness in the thick of my rank and comforts i could not find any ease until everything looked at anyhow and from all bearings contemplated lay before our captain he thought enough to look wise and then he said that really i was fit to see to such little things myself he had heard of a small boy covered with such a great deal of yellow hair this should have been fetched off long ago and what was the barber kept for thus it always does befall me to be thrown back without guidance on my own resources and even lieutenant blewett with whom i next went to hold council was more inclined to stretch and gape after a heavy spell on deck than to bring his mind to bear upon this child's adventures send the poor little beggar in he said and let me look at him if i can keep my eyes open llewellyn you always did love savages lieutenant you would not like me to account you in the number 
davy you might fairly do it when i come off deck like this send him in ere i snooze old fellow this i did and when the boy entered a shyly putting one hand to his forelocks as i had instructed him a beam of the newly risen sun broke in through a bull's eye and made a golden frame for him in the middle of this he looked so innocent and so comely and at the same time so well bred that master rodney's sleepy eyes fell open with wonder at him this was my doing of course entirely soap and discipline is my signal to the next generation and nothing else can counteract all the heresies around us therefore this little boy's cheeks were brighter than any rose from toweling and his beautiful eyes without speck of dirt and the top of his head as sweet and curly as a feathering hyacinth when i perceive that i have had the luck to make an impression my rule is to say nothing at all but appear to be unaware of it this rule is founded on common sense and it took me so long to find it out that it ought to be worth something otherwise what offence one gives and not only that but consider how seldom the man who succeeds deserves it any modest man like me upon any moderate success is bound to examine himself and feel less confidence than he used to have his success is enough to prove according to the ways of the world that he never can have deserved it this remembrance led me now to abstain from even patting harry as we had named this little fellow on his golden head at all lest i should manifest undue pride in a creature of my creation for such he was beyond all mistake and it would have given me pleasure to back him for a crown against any boy in our fleet or any three in the whole french navy taking age of course and size into consideration what a fine little fellow said rodney bluett why he ought to be a midshipman i had no idea your savages could turn out such young ones i must see what i can do for him davy only i can't think of anything now perceiving that i was likely to do more harm than good by pressing the matter just then i took little harry away with me and found him quite full of the young lieutenant's brave appearance and kindly smile in a word they were pleased with one another so heartily and so lastingly that it was the luckiest day perhaps of poor little harry's unlucky career when i first commended him to the notice of the honourable rodney for this latter was now not only a general favourite in the ship but also a great power being our second luff and twice as active as our first was he took the boy under his especial care and taught him all sorts of ennobling things how to read and write and spell and clean boots and wait at breakfast so that i felt many qualms sometimes quite apart from all narrow methods of regarding anything and springing from the simple fear that the child might be spoiled for his station in life and fail to become a good seaman End of chapter fifty four chapter fifty five of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter fifty five upon foreign service at length when all sailors hearts were sick with vain hopes of some enterprise france did a truly bold thing by declaring war against great britain those people before this had given occasion for the strongest scandal by taking their king and queen in a dastardly manner and cutting their heads off indignation and hot hatred ran throughout england and wales at the news but our government did no more than politely request that the london agent of these cut-throats should withdraw 
nevertheless i cannot be wrong as my pension comes from government in saying that to my mind the british government at this noble crisis behaved in a most forbearing prudent christian generous glorious and magnanimous manner they waited for war to be proclaimed by france before they accepted it and then they proved themselves as wholly unready as they ought to be what finer state of feeling can be shown by any country it must have been either the end of february or the early part of march in the year of grace seventeen hundred and ninety three when we heard of this grand and momentous affair and i remember the date by this that the onions were sprouted and we were compelled to make shift with shallots for calling at falmouth to victual a little we sent three boats ashore and i of course was in command of one and though we spread abroad and ransacked all the cornish gardeners hoards and gave them a taste of boat-hooks because they had no proper things not an onion could we find except with a crooked thumb to it nor were the young ones yet fit to pull and this fixes the date to a week or so and now we found that the whole of us were to be turned over while the bellona was refitting to the seventy-four gunship defence with the orders for the west indies at once as was generally believed to protect our shipping and commerce there for although the war had been so very long looked forward to our government was not ready yet but had to send squadrons right and left to see to our foreign interests while portsmouth chatham and even london had very few ships to defend them our charity never begins at home as poor bardie's did in her copy-book however it chanced to turn out all right because the other side was quite as much abroad as we were some of our men were inclined to grumble at having barely a spree ashore when they longed for a turn at home again but the admiralty settled that by not paying their back wages which is the surest way of all for keeping a fellow well up to his work his temptation for running is gone because he has no cash to run with neither do his people want him while in that condition this he knows well and it makes him think and nine times out of ten he resolves to double what is due to him and really pocket it when again due and almost be admired by his own wife therefore most part of us tumbled over from the bellona into the defence after some liberty ashore which for a godly man like me was nothing more than a trial captain drake bampfylde worked harder than even parson chowne's horses were said to do and as for me but i will not say for it now becomes unbecoming enough that the defence cleared outward of the no man buoy the very day three weeks from the date of the bellona standing inwards we had the wind at east northeast as it always is in spring-time now it may seem out of place and even very rude on my part but i could not altogether help a strong desire to know how our captain this time managed in the matter of the female sex i had my own feelings towards poor young polly and a hankering to let her see me which however must not now be gratified on either side and of course a man feels when this is the case that another man must be like him however the rules of the service forbade me to put any questions on private affairs to an officer thus set over me and as for observing him that was below me even if time had availed for it heaviside also had shown such ill-feeling and even downright ingratitude towards me simply because my position and rank had compelled me to teach him his distance which he was somehow too stupid to learn especially since his rash elevation and appointment as our chief boatswain which made it the more incumbent upon me to preserve a firm attitude this fellow i say was so utterly wanting in that deference which the master of a line of battle-ship not only has a right to expect but is even bound to exact that i could not now approach him with inquiries about our captain and this became tenfold more painful as soon as i saw that he knew something what french sailors could have a chance with a fleet under sir john jervis 
I cannot tell how many islands we took, for we could not stop to count them. We caught just the tail of the hurricane of the 12th and 13th of August, which ever will be remembered as the most terrible ever known. None of us had the luck to see the pine bulkhead blown through the palm tree, or the whole of a sugar estate set down on the other side of the mountain. But a sailor asks credit for his stories because he has given it and otherwise no tales can go on i need not dwell on our victories here except for the sake of harry savage as we had dubbed the poor nympton boy for want of legitimate surname in one little skirmish ashore somewhere i think in san domingo this little fellow by genuine courage and unusual nimbleness saved the life of his friend and protector our lieutenant bluett for while the lieutenant was engaged sword to sword with one vile republican another of yet more rampant nature made at him as it were flankwise and must have given him a bitter stab if harry had not with a sudden jump grappled the rogue by the leg so tightly that down he came on his face with a curse so far as their language enables them and we were so enraged i assure you at the duplicity of this fellow that we borrowed a dirk from a little middy and gave it to harry to stick him with but this our young savage refused to do and turned quite pale at the thought of it so that we placed that equality man at the mercy of the french royalists who were acting with us at that period and these made very short work with him as justice demanded with a ringleader of pestilential principles also in a manner which true modesty forbids to dwell upon because neither of us had clothes on i saved the life before very long of our new boatswain heaviside this worthy fellow was swimming along in his usual independent style after kicking his good wife's shackles off when i having taken the inside of him as his superior officer discovered a shark of unusual size desirous to swallow our boatswain that this should never come to pass was my resolve immediately although i could not quite see how to be in time to stop it for heaviside with his usual conceit and desire to show himself off was floating on his back with arms laid square and beard on breast and legs spread out like rolling pins and the shark at twenty knots an hour split the blue water towards him any man but myself would have given him over or left all the rest to help him especially after his utterly republican want of deference to me however such want of sympathy was almost impossible so that i swam with all speed to heaviside where he lay floating grandly look there i shouted all up with you ben unless you capitulate and with these words i pointed out the fin of the shark advancing royal sharks we always called them being the largest sharks in the world in and around port royal heaviside had his fat legs foremost and the royal shark stopped to look at them will you or will you not i asked while preserving with some difficulty a proper position behind him for even a royal shark could have wanted nothing more after heaviside oh davy davy i will he answered only only save me the look which he gave was now enough to make me sink small questions especially as the poor fellow managed being a first-rate swimmer to offer me almost foremost to the jaws of the shark just opening therefore as this latter creature rolled on his side to make at us what did i do but a thing which none except a great fisherman could have done to wit i plucked from its strings the boatswain's heavy periwig which had often vexed me on account of its pretension and clapping it on a piece of sugar-cane which lay floating handy down the wide jaws of the shark i thrust it to improve his appetite faithless people may doubt my word when solemnly i declared to them that this great monster of the waters coughed and sneezed like a christian and we found him rolling dead the next morning with this obstruction in his throat thus by much caution and presence of mind i saved our boats and not only from the jaws of a shark but from a far more fatal error arrogance and downright contumacy which had made him refuse to touch his hat to his superior officer 
Now I need not have mentioned this little affair, except that it bears upon my story, inasmuch as it reconciled master and boatswain, and enabled them both to work together for the benefit of their captain. Among poor Heaviside's many weak qualities, one of the most conspicuous was a resolute curiosity. This compelled him to open a great part of the breadth of his nature to the legitimate or otherwise affairs of his fellow creatures and being an orthodox champion of wedlock from the moment he left his wife and children without any power to draw on him he helped all the rest of the world in this way as a host recommends his hot pickles therefore he had been chosen by very bad taste upon somebody's part and an utter forgetfulness of me to be up at our captain's snap of a wedding and to say amen to it what could be worse than a huddle of this kind and a broad scattering afterwards if they had only invited me both sense and honesty would have been there as well as a man not to be upset by things however female that was their own concern of course and it misbecame me to think of it and i saw upon further consideration that my sturdy honesty might not quite have suited them for women are able with the help of men to work themselves up to anything you may call them the shot and men the powder or you may take quite another view and regard them as the powder with a superior man at the touch-hole anyhow off they go and who shall ask the reason for from what heaviside told me it seems that the captain and his fair isabel before our present cruise began had resolved that no one should ever be able legally to sever them but one special term of the compact was that the outer world should have no acquaintance with things that had happened between them in other words that they should leave their excellent friends and relatives all in the dark about this matter as well as save the poor captain's oath by quitting each other immediately it is to the utmost extent beyond my own experience to deny that this is the wisest of all arrangements if there can be anything wise after the deed of wedlock for what can equal severance in the saving of disagreement however they had not the wisdom as yet to look at it in this light and the one wept and the other sighed when they parted at the churchyard gate for the defence must sail at one p m the lady had been content to come and dwell in a very dirty village of the name of gosport so that the licence might be forthcoming from proper people when paid for because of course in her own county nothing could have been done without ten thousand people to talk of it and thus they were spliced without hoisting flag forever spliced both in soul and in law which takes the lead of the other one and yet in body severed always till there should come fair repute a common man of my rank in life and having no more than common sense must often find himself all abroad with wonder about his superiors they seem to look at things as if everything and every person were looking back at them again instead of trusting to the lord to oversee the whole of it if i had been of the proper age and a lovely rich maid in love with me would i have stopped even twice to think what the world might say about us heaviside's opinion was that the lady wished to hide nothing whatever but proclaim before all people where and when and whom she wedded and how proud she was of him but the captain in his kind regard and tenderness for her feelings durst not expose her to the pain and sense of wrong which might ensue upon his name coming forward thus with the county thinking as it did and himself not there to vindicate and of course he knew with what vigour and skill vile parson chowne would set to at once to blacken his character and to make his bride a most unhappy one therefore sir philip bamfylde and the ancient earl of pomeroy were the only persons present of their rank and kindred and both of these confessed the wisdom of the captain's arguments now on the thirtieth of april seventeen ninety four at about the hour of sundown our anchor was scarcely beginning to bite in Sand bay when the barge of the old port admiral was alongside of us we had long been foregathering what we would do as soon as we got ashore again but now we could only shake heads and fear that the whole would be disappointment 
and thus it proved and even worse for many of our company inasmuch as our orders were to make sail at once for st helens and there to join the channel fleet under admiral lord howe therefore we carried on again with a gale from south-west to favour us and on the first of may we brought up in the midst of a large society End of chapter fifty five chapter fifty six of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter fifty six exiles of society a finer sight was never seen than we had now around us for all the convoy was come together as well as the british fleet empowered to protect them i stood in our foretop and counted one hundred and fifty-two large sail nearly fifty of which were men of war and all the rest goodly merchantmen a sight like this not only strengthens a briton's faith in providence but puts him into a quiet pride concerning his king and country we had scarcely swung to our moorings ere we had signal from the admiral not a man to be allowed ashore water and victual all night and be ready to weigh again at daybreak of course we did so though a hard thing upon us and new hands desired to grumble until captain bampfylde rigged the gratings heaviside now was known to have such a swing of arm with a flick to it never being satisfied with his mate's administration that never a man of patriotic sentiments encroached on him we all determined to sail once more and let the french see what our nature was although they might hope to find it spoiled by our being away from home so much especially when we heard that they had three hundred and fifty sail or more of merchantmen coming home all very rich and fattened up for capture what we wanted therefore was to see our own good traders free from any chance of piracy and at the same time to stop those french from wicked importations if in both points we might succeed and give battle afterwards our gratitude to the lord would almost equal our own glory and we heard that the mob in paris would starve failing of all this american fleet on the second of may the wind fetched back to its proper place at that time of year north-north-east with snow-clouds always ready to endorse it and thus we slipped from our moorings and went quietly down channel concerning the rest we have no cause to plead for man's indulgence the lord continued to baffle us and would not give us any help to close quarters with the enemy we fought three days of rolling battle ending on the first of june after two days of fog interrupting and not a breath of sleep four nights every one says that we fought very well having everything so much against us and the french fleet far superior carrying also a representative of the human race large and fat and fluent of the name of john bone andrews who wrote a noble account of this action although before it began his feelings led him to seek security in a hole far below the water-line but one of the strangest things ever seen and thoroughly worth considering was the behaviour of our two savages under heavy fire two i say although we had three because cannibal jack behaved most steadily and like a thorough christian but the two others most strongly proved their want of civilization and gross ignorance of war inasmuch as no sooner did they see the opening of bloodshed round them than mad they became as mad i assure you as any march hares the brace of them in the thick of our combat with the towerful up and down the deck these fellows danced in the most conspicuous places as if inviting every shot and cracking their knuckles and jabbering i was for lashing them to the mainmast but captain bamfylde would not allow it he said that their spirited conduct might encourage and cheer the rest of us and indeed it was strange to see how the shot flew around without striking them 
now these poor fellows showed so much attachment and strong confidence towards me that when we cast anchor in plymouth sound being detached for refitment there together with eight other ships of the line i took it entirely upon myself to see them safe home and to answer for them our ship had been knocked about so much that she needed a thorough good overhauling and many of us had a month's leave of absence while carpenters caulkers and riggers were working and these three savages outwent all of us in longing to see their homes again so it struck me that i might both satisfy them and also gratify myself a little by taking them under my escort as far as their native mud-holes and then for a week perhaps enjoying good young polly's society captain bampfylde not only agreed to this but said that he should not care tuppence if he never saw two of their number again he meant of course dick and joe whose habits of larceny never could be thrashed out whereas cannibal jack was now become as honest a hand as myself almost and a valuable foretopman having pledged my word to bring this one back safe and the others as well if they chose to come i set forth the foot for a cruise across devon than which in the summer with plenty of money what can be more delightful i would gladly have taken young harry savage now a fine lad of fifteen years so far as one might guess it but jack declared that he must not come for some reason not to be told to me now it was the flush of summer very nearly twelve years from the time i first began with sunny hedges spread their overlap of roses over us while the glad leaves danced in time with light and shade to foster them every bank of every lane was held at home with flowers nourished by some flitting rill that made a tinkle for them and through every gate almost whenever there was a man to look the spread of feathered grasses ran like water with the wind on it even a sailor may see such things and his heart rejoice and be glad in them and his perilous life for a while have rest without any thought of anything be that so neither dick nor joe ever made glance at anything except the hen roosts near the road or the haunt of a young rabbit in the hedge or the nesting of a partridge i kept the poor fellows from doing harm by precept and example too yet we had a roast fowl every night except when it was a boiled one and finding myself in my sixty-fourth year what could i do but put up with it it must be three score miles i think even according to the shortest cut from plymouth to nympton on the moors and we wandered out of the way of course especially after guinea fowls which are most deluding creatures but roast even better than their eggs boil also we got into cherry orchards of a very noble breed so that we spent a whole day and two nights without any power to say farewell and though the farmer's wife put up both hands to us at the window she sent out the maid to say that we need not be frightened if we were real sailors after giving this girl a kiss to let her know what our profession was i sent in word that here was the master of his majesty's ship defence which had defended the british empire in the late great victory that night they made all of us drunk except me upon these sweet little incidents i must venture to dwell no longer while having so much of my yarn in the slack and none but myself to tauten it enough that we came in about ten days to the genuine naked colony without any meaning of surprise but now as great ambassadors and the least that we all expected was a true outburst of wild welcoming cannibal jack had announced his intention to convert his relatives while dick and joe only shook their heads and seemed to doubt the advantage of it but we need not have thought of the matter twice for strange to say not one of the savages would for a moment acknowledge us all the barbarous tribe stood aloof and scowled at their old members with utter abhorrence and contempt as if at some vast degeneracy even jack's wife or the woman who might in humanity have been called so stood moping and mowing at him afar as if his clothes made a sheep of him while he with amazement regarded her as if she were only a chimpanzee whereupon all of them set up a yell and rushed with such pelting of mud at us that we thought ourselves lucky to make our escape without any further mischief after hauling out of action in this most inglorious manner we brought up to refit and revictual at the nearest public-house a lonely hut where four roads met and the sign hung from an ancient gibbet 
here we were treated very kindly and for very little money so that i was quite astonished after all our feeding and i happened to say to the landlady that i was surprised to find honesty within a league of parson chowne oh sir do you know that dreadful man she answered with her apron up or would you like to see him sir madam said i with that bow of mine which takes the women captive i should like to see him wonderfully only without his seeing me of course of course all people say that because of the evil eye he hath this house doth belong to him he be coming for the rent again at two o'clock and he never faileth every farthing will be ready now through your honour's generosity and if so be you steps in here when you hear me give three knuckles at the door you may see him and welcome for nothing only you must not speak for ever so the landlady showed me a little cellar opening from our sitting-room and having a narrow half-boarded hatchway bearing upon her sanded parlour where she designed to receive the parson and then she was half afraid lest i might make a noise and so betray her but almost before i had time to assure her of my perfect secrecy the dash of horses hoofs was heard and the sound of a man's voice shouting well done said i to myself good parson years have not decreased thee his strong step rang on the lime ash floor and his silver spurs made a jingle and lo there he stood in the sanded parlour as noble a chown as ever there was not the sign of a spot of weakness or relenting about him on his shaven face no bloom of greyness nor in his coal-black hair one streak as vigorous springy and strenuous seemed he as when he leaped on board and thrashed me nearly twelve years agone as i do believe woman where is my money he cried with the old pale frown overcoming him twice i have given you time you know what i always do thereafter yes sir i know what your reverence doth your reverence never calleth law but taketh horsewhip to the mans of us your memory is correct he answered my usual course is to that effect i have brought my heaviest whip this time for your husband has shown arrogance can you show cause why he should not have it yes your reverence here it is and god knows how we have scraped for it with the glow of triumph which a man's face hardly ever shows but a woman's cannot be denied of she spread before him all his rent upon an ancient tray and every piece of it was copper thirty-six shillings she had to pay and twenty-four times thirty-six was there for his reverence to count the hostess looked at him with a chuckle brewing now upon her apron-strings and ready to rise to her ample breast and thence to her mouth if expedient but she mistook her customer woman said chowne in his deep low voice which had no anger in it i am tired of signing warrants warrants your worship for what if you please warrants for thieves who are foisting sham irish halfpennies on the public i see no less than seven of them in this sterling stuff of yours three months at the treadmill now for yourself and your husband say no more you have tried a trick tiverton jail for you both to-morrow and there if you wanted either of them you must go to find them only two days afterwards according to what i was told of it no welsh gentleman would have dreamed of behaving to his tenants thus for trying a little joke with him but chowne had no sense of any joke unless himself began it our three cannibals had been trembling at the sound of the parson's voice believing that he would drive them back and feeling that they had no power to withstand his orders but luckily we had made such a smoke all our savages having taken to the use of tobacco gloriously that when the parson put his head in as he must do everywhere he drew it back in double quick time for he hated the weed as old nick does and then after calling his groom as a witness to the irish coinage he made him tie the whole of the rent money in his pocket handkerchief and off he set at a good round gallop to make out the warrant you may depend upon it that we four were very soon off as well and in the opposite direction after subscribing a guinea among us to comfort the poor woman who was sobbing her heart out at her mistake and at the prospect as seemed to me of being confined in more senses than one within the walls of a prison for some time i found myself much at a loss about harbouring my convoy for though i could trust jack wildman as i now began to call him anywhere and with anything this was not the case with the other two who could never be kept from picking up small things that took their fancy we were shaping a course for narnton court where i intended to sling my own hammock and jack's as well if agreeable but i durst not offer to introduce dick and joe for the cause aforesaid 
moreover they had not yet acquired the manners of good society which were no little insisted upon in sir philip bampfylde's kitchen therefore i thought myself very clever when a settlement of this question suddenly occurred to me this was no less than to settle them both under my old ferry-boat if still to be found as two years back shored up and turned into a residence their rations might be sent down to them and what happier home could they wish for with the finest air in the world around them as well as beautiful scenery and if it should happen to leak a little as seems only natural what a blessed reflection for a man of due sentiments towards the lord that this water is dropping from heaven upon him instead of rushing up to swallow him into that outrageous sea accordingly so we contrived this affair mr jack wildman was introduced under my skilful naval tactics into the most accomplished circle on the quarter-deck of our head cook and he looked so very gently wild and blushed in his clothes so beautifully that there was not a maiden all over the place but longed to glance unbeknown at him so that it seemed a most lucky thing that polly was down with the smallpox at a place called mudaford wherein she had an uncle meanwhile cannibals dick and joe lived in the boat as happily as if they had been born in it and devoted their time to the slaying and cooking of sir philip's hares and rabbits it was in vain that the gamekeepers did their best to catch them dick and joe could catch hares as they boasted to me almost under the watcher's noses so noble was the result of uniting civilized cunning with savage ingenuity i can well believe that no other man either of my rank or age would have ventured on the step which now i did resolve upon this was no less than to pay a visit to my poor little polly and risk all probabilities of being disfigured by smallpox for several times it had crossed my mind that although she was among relatives they were not like a father or mother to her and perhaps she might be but poorly tended and even in need of money perhaps for her very own aunt our mrs cock hanterbury would not go nigh her and almost shuddered when her name was mentioned now it seemed to be only fair and honest to let sir philip know my intention so that he might if he should see fit forbid me to return to his mansion bringing the risk of infection but the general only shook his head and smiled at that idea if it be the will of god we shall have it of course he said and people run into it all the more by being over timorous and i have often thought it sinful to mistrust the lord so however you had better keep smoking a pipe and not stay more than five minutes and perhaps you might just as well change your clothes before you come back and sink the others to air for a week in the river i was grieved to see him so entirely place his faith in providence for that kind of feeling when thus overdone ends in what we call fatalism such as the very turks have so that i was pleased when he called me back and said take a swim yourself llewellyn i hear that you can swim five miles don't attempt that but swim too if you like swim back to us from barnstaple bridge and i will have a boat to meet you with a wholesome wardrobe thus was the whole of it arranged and carried out most cleverly i took poor polly a bunch of grapes from one of the narnton vineries as well as a number of nice little things such as only a sailor can think of and truly i went not a day too soon for i found her in that weak condition after the fury of the plague is past when every bit of strengthening stuff that can be thought of or fancied by the feeble one may turn the scale and one cheering glance or one smiling word is as good as a beam of the morning then after a long walk i made my swim and a change of clothes exactly as the general had commanded me in a fortnight afterwards where was i why under the boat in a burning madness without a soul to come nigh me except jack wildman and sir philip these two with the most noble courage visited me through my sad attack of smallpox as i was told thereafter although at the time i knew no one and at a distance around the boat a ring of brushwood was kept burning day and night to clear the air and warn the unwary from entering everybody gave me up for a living christian any more and my coffin was ordered at a handsome figure as a death upon narnton premises i am made also like that of the greatest man that i ever did meet with not only this but two nonconformist preachers found out as they always do that in a weak period of my life when dissatisfied with my pension i had been washed away by my poor wife into the scuppers of dissent therefore they prepared two sermons on this judgment of the lord and called me a scapegoat while goodness knows what care they took never to lay hands on me End of chapter fifty six